Hey, I'm Pops. Episode two, Secret Invasion. And remember, I watch it so you don't have to. But we're going to go through a lot of this episode because I kind of have to give you some visuals with a couple parts. I have to kind of take you through a few things. So thanks for watching. Let's do it. All right, I'm Pops. Secret Invasion. Not a fan of episode one. Didn't care for another uh, deteriorating old man story with a ton of like plot hole issues and little things that I just just didn't really care for. It was not the worst thing they've done, but it's so built on a foundation of just a mess. And the biggest thing is we kind of step forward in making it a bigger mess. And yet we kind of address a couple things, which to me, I think we're going to see like who edited this who who put all this together because i think if you had just reordered the first and second episode it would have actually made a much smoother storyline like like it, uh, part of the mess is it's it gets it's gobbledygook with the first it because the first episode they were trying to uh create a false sense of intrigue and an explosion and a twist and yet they didn't give you enough information in some ways and what the end result was you come away like I, I just don't really even care about any of these things and here we're at least given motivations and some backstory and some of the elements that we were kind of needing to be along for the journey and I'm like well how many people bail out of after episode one we don't even want to give it a shot now and then you don't necessarily have a clear vision at least you don't seem to because if you did it makes no sense well, let's just do this. Let's just get right to it. How's that? Let's just, <laughs> I know, I know. Why talk? Let's, so this is one of the things, let me pull up my uh, graphic here because God knows they're going to hit me with stuff. So this is the main sequence that I was saying earlier when I was talking about how um, something should have been in the first episode. This whole 1995 recapping and, and all of this stuff in the very beginning and all of this, I think all of this should have been in the, in, in episode one, maybe, you know, whether or not they do the 95 part or the 97 part, it doesn't really matter too much to me because they easily could have had some of this in, epi in, in the first episode because it would have given us an understanding and motivations, um, because what we did in episode one was talk about this happening and not just showing it. If you already filmed it and showed it, why did we, we didn't need to discuss it. So I'm saying the episode one and two could have been merged or, you know, tweak. This is the typical Disney stuff. So uh, this is just basically the initial conversations of, I need your help to protect earth, which again, some pretty shady stuff that's been going on all along that Nick Fury is using shapeshifters for his means, for whatever his motivations are. And we have to just go on the assumption that it's always in good intentions, right? Um, and that we, we have this promise of we'll find you a planet, which again, I didn't get into this in episode one and I didn't really listen to very many reviews. Uh, Joker Voice did a review. There's a couple of people who did a review and I, and I, I don't know if they said this or not, but uh, one thing that bothers me and I haven't, I didn't really touched on this was the scrolls are clearly more technologically advanced than the earthlings. Why is it they need us to find them a planet? And why don't they just use Captain Marvel as the ambassador? And why are they not blaming her for not finding them a planet? And by the way, the guardians have made their presence known. And we have this whole Thanos and blip thing. It's there's a lot of information that's sort of like omitted from this whole, we blame fury concept but that's pretty much the premise of this motivation early on and you can see i mentioned this in the last episode review with the scars if you go back to avengers this scar was like half the size that it is here um and i think he had a much better looking and more appealing looking eye patch that literally looks like the lens was popped out of an old pair of sunglasses and strapped to his head rather than an appropriate eye patch which we associate with nick fury all right then we cut to our time and the, the horrible ai credits and all of that 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get let me get to what actually is happening in this scene because this is in the explosion, and then you have um, two people who are thrown into vans, and one person is revealed to be um, Talos, who grabs Fury. Then the horrible AI, and then there's a train scene because they're looking for Fury. And um, let me see here. I I I. I I really hated this sequence. First off, I don't know about anybody else. I am not seeing him as Nick Fury in this show so far. All I see is Sam Jackson. I see him wearing the hats and this beard, the way he dresses. I don't see Nick Fury, the covert spy. Oh, sorry. He liked the term spook. I said it. Um, so that's out there. And there's all this back and forth train dialogue a little bit here with stuff. And it's this weird, cringy move to, I guess, equate a whole lot of like Earth's history with this, you know, my mom and I went back and forth to Detroit. We played this game. Tell me something I don't know things. I was on this car and, you know, we didn't have working back. Like, what is, what does, let's just presume all of that is true. What does that have to do with anything? Why are we wasting time, writers, with your uh, uh, racist American history in this show when we just need to get to information? He needs to get information out of Talos. So what does him sharing um, America was racist help with that conversation or get information? I, I don't understand the point. And then again, this entire design and look of Fury is not Fury. It's just Sam, Samuel L. Jackson. So it's just this wasted thing. And then we end up into a screaming match because now Nick Fury, the super spy, doesn't know all the scrolls ended up here. And there's at least a million of them have, that are and have been living there. And Talos didn't tell anybody. And I'm like, okay, so this is also Nick Fury's fault. And it's going to be Nick Fury's fault because he doesn't want to tell anyone. We're going to have a whole scene about that. We, I mean, I can understand you don't want to call in like a hundred superheroes or could we call in like two? Like surely, <laughs> and I'm still shocked that like even Talos, like there's not a way to tell if someone's human or scroll. It makes no sense. And I, I mean like none, like zero. Um, some of the production value of the show I thought was actually okay and the performances are fine this is the grieving widow of Maria Hill and you have another uh, it's all your fault line which <sighs> the problem is, is is if he were a spy and we were to treat him as a spy he can't say the shape-shifting alien made itself look like me and I'm the one that killed her that would have made the scene anyway. I don't know. The scene is a little, little too long because it's just another pile on Nick Fury thing. Then you have this extremely disturbing recreation of what newscasts look like because it makes you realize how much Disney and how easily Disney can do that. And then we have Gaia and Gravik driving around. And then there's just like, and there's just like this normal, irritating, uh, grandiose type lecturing and conversation that comes out of Gravik. Like he just thinks he's so much smarter than he is. He thinks his idea is so much better. I don't know. There's no sense though, that he would have a clue how to run a planet or the scrolls if he were to get control and how things will actually operate. He just, he just knows that's what he wants to do. Um, his motivation is actually okay. Um, then we have this, this, so this is the big reveal scene where he sits down with the council and it's all the leaders. So we have the president, we have the prime minister, the one guy's in charge of NATO. They start speaking in scroll. He starts lecturing. This is a big thing about being a dog or not. And there's basically a big vote about making Gravik basically the scroll general, because they're all scrolls. Everyone's a scroll. Prime minister, president, NATO, everyone's scroll. The one person that's not a scroll gets off the phone. Oh, sorry, no, she's a scroll. She just didn't want to go along with the general. She gets off the phone calls. Talos, who basically just says, uh, I don't care at all about the humans. She didn't say, he didn't say anything about the humans, the invasion, 
fury, none of it. He just, she did. He just says, oh, I want to talk to him about my daughter. So I'm like, I don't even understand what we're doing here. Then it's the, then it's exactly the Falcon and winter soldier all over again, where it's the freedom fighter mentality, the revolutionaries, they have no idea what to do with the bone when they get it, but that's what they're all going for. So they're cheering along their mindless leader. Who's now running a secret lab, which is now run by the Daltons. That's who these people are. They're running experimentation. And before we cut away with that. Okay. And then we end up with this also irritating scene with Don Cheadle. So Don Cheadle is Rhodey. He's war machine. He is treated with zero respect and he treats world leaders with zero respect. So I don't know how I kind of have mixed feelings. Like this is a pretty good representation of foreign policy. Like, they treat us like crap. We treat them like crap. We tell them what we're going to do and we disregard what they want, but they also want us to just do things for them and be blamed, even though they don't do anything on their own. They're not responsible. Like it's just such a mess. Um, but basically it's again, blame fury. It's all fury's fault. It's pretty much the get go of all this. Of course, there's a phone and they're going to go to the diner. This is possibly one of the worst scenes in all of Disney um, plus show Marvel right now. He, Nick Fury's take with the sit down with Rhodey isn't, we need heroes. He's like, no, we don't want heroes. I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this and help a brother out. Like you're a black brother. I'm like, what the heck are we doing? Like Nick Fury, the super spy who understands how all this works. He's like, well, I was there for you. I had your back. And we rose up and they make an Alexander Pierce reference. So if those of you who don't remember Alexander Pierce, because it's been a minute since Winter Soldier, Alexander Pierce is the Robert Redford character. So he is the guy leading Hydra and doing all of that stuff. These guys have risen to their ranks in the wake of how all of that was run because evidently Alexander Pierce and others are racist. So help a brother out. Now, I will admit Rhodey's dialogue and his pushback is pretty good. Like, screw you, help a brother out. I'm just here to fire you. And these guys are going to take you away. And then, um, and again, I see Sam Jackson in all this. I'd never see Nick Fury. And they got to get rid of the beard. They got to change his wardrobe. They got to do something that makes me feel like he's Nick Fury because he is not. Anyway, he just has a beat down real quickly on this guy, just showing how cool he is before we cut. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't get too far there because there's one. Why is this scene in here? I, I really, and I am not trying to be facetious. I really, really don't understand why this scene is here. It's a sit on the bench and he's wheezing phase. Okay. If the entire premise is that Nick Fury wants to take all care of all this all by himself and he's this ill, why would, why did, why, why do us in the audience going to buy in that any of that makes sense? It's retarded. And it, again, blame Nick Fury. Well, I'm going to blame Nick Fury because if you're this ignorant at what you're doing, you don't care about the human race and earth. You're just, it's all an ego trip. Well, then we get to the scene, which is possibly one of the coolest scenes that just refuses to go all the way. And I don't know why they didn't even have to do it. So what they do is they have girl boss come in, shoo away a whole bunch of Russian torture people. There's a quick little shot of her cutting a finger off. So it's revealing that this guy is the scroll. Now they caught him at the, where the uh, Moscow attack was. So they know he's there. He's a revolutionary. Where's Gravik's thing? He's not going to tell them anything, right? So it's basically a torture thing. And she has this syringe of stuff. Let me go back. I'm sorry. Uh, she has this syringe that she starts putting in there. And then what we do is we cut away to Gaia She's doing some research, and here she's finding that whatever research it is, it involves DNA from these other organisms like Groot and a frost giant. So when they cut back, the serum, is, she, she mentions it's going to boil him from the inside out. And again, at the bottom of that screen that Gaia was looking at, it says extremist. Let me see if, if we have it. Uh, let me see if I can let's play. So it's showing DNA. All right, it's not going to help me play. I, did, I just this is the this is one of the the more frustrating elements of trying to share this with you and not get copyright struck or whatever else. But 
But here's the thing. It says extremists. So he's boiling from the inside out. But they refuse to go all the way with it. Because if he had, if he was extremist and they had this serum that he could stick in someone, this was what happens. And there, she asks where the secret hatch is, so she leaves. The, so she's on the run and gets away before Gravik and them could show up to kill everybody. If they open the door and he he went full extremist like we saw in Iron Man three, and we just saw him just basically explode, that would have been fantastic. And then, God, by the way, then we don't need all of this wasted time showing them just randomly shooting people. Showing them drive driving around, blah blah blah, take him to the woods to kill him, kind of nonsense. Just wasting our time. There's nothing. We're what we're supposed to think he's ruthless. He doesn't seem ruthless. He just seems like someone that wants to skip the line at a Starbucks. Ah, uh, then we cut, and we end up with the final scene. Nick Fury comes home. Um, they keep intercutting to um. A woman cutting. Oh, wait, we got to back up because we have to see the scene. We have to play, I can't play it because there's music. It's a scroll cooking. Oh, that's right. He has to go get it to Jeep. So he has some random safe house. We don't know why no one's following him. We have no idea why everybody doesn't know where he is. He just wanders around, has this safe house. Evidently, the oil's not gone bad, just so you know. Car commercial and all. He shows up and his wife is a scroll. Put the wedding ring on, they kiss, and blah, blah, blah. So that's our episode. Really, really, really not as let down as episode one. It's much better. Moves a whole lot of things forward, but it creates more complications. It continues to pile on how bad Nick Fury is. I wish we could edit all of these first two episodes. Let's, let's say we have a third episode. I bet we can do exactly what we talked about, Andrew. I think, um, I think Joker said it. It's going to be Andor all over again. We could take three episodes and we can make two. There's a good story in there, but it's muddled up into a whole bunch of mess run by a whole bunch of incompetent people. Sorry, but we have to blame Nick Fury. That's what we have to do. All right. Well, that's my take on it. Tell me what you guys think. And if nothing else, I watched it. So you didn't have to take care, everybody. <music>